afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the joint uh, meeting uh, of the Glendale City Council and Glendale Housing Authority. Maybe we have roll call. Um, roll call for council. Uh, council members Brotman. Here. Arpetian. Here. Kasakian. Here. Najarian. Here. Mayor Satrian. Here. And may we have a roll call for the Housing Authority? Yes. Housing Authority members Ajinian. Here. Asatrian. Here. Brotman. Here. Carpetian? Here. Najarian? Here. Parazian? Here. Chair Kazakian? Here. Next item. Um, my report is the agenda for the Tuesday, June 25th, 2024 joint public meeting of the City Council and Housing Authority was posted on June 20th, 2024 on the bulletin board outside City Hall. Um, the one item on the agenda is the uh, item one, community services and parks regarding acceptance of grant funds from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for the 2023 Continuum of Care Program and note and file the City of Glendale's 2024 homeless point in time count. A, Council motion approving acceptance of grant funds in the amount of $2,930,721 from the Department of Housing and Urban Development for the 2023 continu Continuum of Care program, authorizing the city manager or designee to execute all agreements, certifications, and documents necessary to accept and implement the funds, and noting and filing the City of Glendale's 2024 homelessness point in time count. B, council resolution of appropriation to appropriate grant funds in the amount of $2,930,721 received from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for the 2023 Continuum of Care Program. C, Housing Authority motion approving acceptance of grant funds in the amount of $2,930,721 from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for the 2023 year Continuum of Care Program, authorizing the Executive Director or designee to execute all agreements, certifications, and documents necessary to accept and implement the funds and noting and filing the city of Glendale's 2024 homeless point in time count. That was it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Galanian. Thank you, Mayor Satrian, members of the city council, Chair Kasakian, members of the housing authority. Uh, today you will hear a presentation as it was read into the, read into the record uh, on the continuum of care application to HUD for existing and new uh, homeless services projects that uh, staff goes through every year. In addition, this year they have applied and been successful in uh, getting a new COC planning project. And uh, Ms. Uh, Sayan, our homeless services program manager, who's at the podium, we also cover the, uh, uh, an update on the uh, homeless point in time count that was conducted a few months ago. Ms. Sayan. Wonderful. Good afternoon, Mayor Asaturian. Welcome back. Members of the Housing Authority, Chair Kasakian. I'm sorry, members of City Council, Chair Kasakian, members of the Housing Authority. I will be providing a presentation on um, updates on our COC program competition. In addition to um, providing uh, the release of our 2024 homeless point in time count results. Uh, back in September, um, we did come to council and we did discuss the funding recommendations and the grant application for the 2023 Continuum of Care program. Happy to say that in February, the city was awarded um, grant funds uh, in the amount of $2,930,721. We did initially apply for a little over $2.7 million and there was an increase of about 189,000. Um, and this increase was primarily as a result of the uh, FMR adjustments. So each year, um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development um, adjusts the fair market rents for our programs. And so this increase basi basically accounts for that difference. Um, we also received about a $53,000 increase in our COC planning project, which we're really excited about. Um, this planning project helps support our staff here internally for you know, strategic planning, working on our ESG um, con plan. Um, so that was a really nice uh, increase under the COC planning that we received. So exhibit one does actually break down our funding requested amount and then the difference in, in the award amount in case you wanna look at it more in detail. So 
Um, with that said, this is our uh, award amount for our COC program. And I'm going to jump into the PIT presentation. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have either before or after um, the presentation for the COC program. Any questions? OK, great. I'm sorry, I kept, one, uh -huh. one, one question, if I may. You, you said that the funds requested are part of Exhibit A? Exhibit 1. Exhibit 1. Mm -hmm. um, where is that? Um, it's right behind, it should be right behind the report. We have a list of our COC projects. And then um, it has the requested amount. It looks, it looks like this, a little worksheet. Page oh, 11 oh, of 20. Okay. Page, okay. Yeah, okay. Let's continue. Great, I guess I will jump into the PIT. Am I not doing, Susie? Thank you. Okay, technical difficulty, sorry. Thank you. Phew. I did keep the report much shorter, the presentation this year. <laughs> Last year it was a bit lengthy, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have. So we held the count this year on January 24th. We had a morning count and an evening count. Um, we had a group of community, over 50 community members, organizations, local businesses that came out to support us during the count. So a huge shout out to them. Thank you. Our information services team again this year came through and updated our survey, our mobile survey online. So a thank you, huge thank you to ISD. And of course our Glendale Police Department also participates in this count and helps us out on the morning and evening. Um, we use a mobile survey to do the count um, and the survey is basically able to track all of the results and then that's how we're able to pull the data for our unhoused um, clients. Or individuals. Uh, why we do this every year? Of course, it's required by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. In fact, this 2.9 million that we received um, each year, we do have to compete for these funds, and this is one of the requirements that HUD does set in place for our continuum, along with other COCs. So, and it also helps us make decisions. It does inform the community on what's currently taking place in our city. Uh, of course, it's a snapshot, but it does help spot some trends and patterns um, in our community. And then it does somewhat help us identify our local need. Um, but this year, we had an 8% reduction in our count. Um, we had 195 respondents last year. Um, this year, we had around 179. So that is an overall um, an 8% decrease. 44% of the uh, individuals and families that we counted out of the 179, 44% were those who were unsheltered on the night of the count. 55% uh, of those individuals and families were in some type of a sheltering uh, program, whether it was a congregate shelter, a DV shelter, or in one of our uh, hotel programs that is funded through our local Measure S funds. Overall, there was a 10% decrease in our unsheltered population and about a 6% decrease in our sheltered population from last year to this year. 30% of those we counted were in some type of an emergency shelter program. In 2023, we had 54. This year, we had 55. We had about 35 adults and 20 children on the night of the count in our, in our shelters. 24% were in transitional housing program, and we do just have one transitional housing program here in Glendale, and this program serves DV families. Um, we had 15 adults and 29 children that were in our transitional housing program on the night of the count. Um, a, no a notable trend, actually, an increase, 30% um, of the population identified as chronically homeless. This um, number has gone up. 55% uh, for our unhoused clients. Um, we had 15 last year, we identified 38 this year. 
We had nine last year under the sheltered component. This year we had 16. So overall there was a 55% increase in our chronically homeless population, which is something that we need to keep a closer eye on. Um, it, it is concerning because in the past we were able to consistently reduce this number. This year we find that there is an uptick um, in our chronically homeless population. 62. What do you define as chronically homeless? Oh, yes, thank you. So chronically homeless is a definition that's set forth by HUD. So you have to be consistently homeless for one year, at least 12 months, or you have to have four episodes of homelessness that are equivalent to that one year period. So you either have to have multiple episodes of homelessness or you have to be consistently homeless for one year and you have to have a disabling condition. So if you don't have a disabling condition but you've been homeless for one year, you don't qualify under this category. And so, how, how many of the folks from this year, I don't know if there's a way to track this, are the same people from last year? Um, we, would be, we would be able to track it. It would just take us a little bit, some time to deduplicate or un figure oh, out. The survey, the way it's done is we only capture initials for folks. Um, we don't you know, identify the full name and last name, but I, I will say that some some you know, percent of those clients are, we do see year after year during the count. Um, but that is still a huge uptick, considering we had um, you know, only 15 clients that we had counted for last year versus 38. And we have seen that notable in increase in our community where we are coming across more clients with higher, the higher acuity, uh, more disabling conditions, um, with a extended, you know, length of time that they've been homeless in our community. So we are keeping an eye on that. 62% um, of the respondents um, were uh, victims of DV. Um, we had 56 last year, so there was a slight increase this year. In 2024, we had 62. Um, some more key findings. Um, we did identify 59 respondents that were sleeping on the street. So when we asked where they would be sleeping on the night of the count, about 73% um, were sleeping outdoors and about 18% um, in their vehicles. Another notable, something that I wanted to mention, just as a volunteer myself, uh, actually had the opportunity to serve in North Glendale this year. This would be my third time kind of canvassing the North Glendale area. We did see more people sleeping in their vehicles um, in North Glendale, which was unusual in the past. We don't typically see too many. Um, this year, um, I did want to make mention that we did identify more folks who were sleeping there, some because they work nearby in the local hospitals or they just feel safer in that area. Um, and comparing the numbers to last year, though, we had um, just a 2% increase in, in individuals who were sleeping on the streets and about a 1% increase. So it was mainly the location of the individuals and the vehicles that had kind of changed this year to North Glendale. Um, some other key findings, as far as public benefits, when we asked about 13, 14% stated yes, that they do receive some type of public benefit. Um, 41, 42%, close to 42% stated no, that they do not receive public assistance. And unfortunately, 44% did not answer. They refused to answer the question. This is another area that we wanna keep a close eye on because if we do have outreach teams that are out, out there daily canvassing and connecting with our unhoused neighbors, we wanna make sure that they're getting connected to public benefits and that's one way for them to maintain housing stability is being able to secure an income um, to be able to eventually transition into housing and other services. Employment, about 9% stated that they did have some form of employment um, and unfortunately 44% stated that they were currently unemployed and about 47% did not answer the survey. So. The way we do the survey is we don't require participants to answer any, respondents to answer the questions if they don't feel comfortable. So when we pull the data and the results, we really do this based on those who did um, complete the survey. 15% um, did indicate that they had some type of a disabling condition, about 12% of the respondents who answered, and 33, uh, 33 indicated no. 
We did come across some veterans. We had about five veterans that we identified and one was a family. So it was a single father and his young son. Um, and I'm happy to say that we did connect the clients to services. I did want to mention that all of the individuals that we came across, especially those who were working or sleeping in their vehicles, um, we have attempted to connect the individuals to services. And we have actually seen some successful placements in our EHV program as a result of us making that connection with the clients on the night of the count. Um, so we have seen some success stories come out as a result of the PIT count. Uh, about 3% um, answered yes to um, being released from jail or prison. We have one, pers uh, one person who stated they were newly released from prison. And here's another area that we have to keep a very close eye on is 30% of the respondents indicated that they were homeless for the first time. Um, 24 answered yes. So as part of our state, state funds that we receive, um, this is an area that we really need to be able to um, keep a close eye on. We're trying to reduce the number of individuals and families who are becoming homeless for the first time. Um, trying to get to those families before they even end up on the streets. So 30% is, may not seem like a high number, but it is um, a significant number of people on the night of the count. Of the 30%, um, 42%, 10 out of 24 fell within the age range of 45 to 54. So we're also tracking first time homelessness based on age. Um, in the last three years, we were seeing this gradual increase in the aging population. So we wanted to com you know, continue monitoring this trend. However, this year, um, we had only 13% clients who fell within the uh, 65 and above age group. Now I have to say that's also, as a result of our success in our EHV program, when clients were coming through our coordinated entry system, one of the things that we were looking at was the age category as well. So anybody who was 65 years of age and above and you know, had disabling condition, um, we were prioritizing for housing placement in our EHV programs. So I do have to give a huge shout out to our agencies too for prioritizing the housing placements for this group. Um, we also asked if the respondents became homeless in Glendale, similar to last year, same question. About 35% indicated that, that yes, they did become homeless in Glendale. About 21% said no. And fortunately, 43% did not answer. We also asked how long they lived in Glendale. And about 14% stated that they lived in Glendale for less than a year. And the second highest percentage was more than 10 years. We had 14 respondents. Um, Excuse me, who, may I ask a quick question? Yes. Uh, can you go back one slide? Sure. So you said... Uh, oh, did I skip a slide here? Oh, no. This the one is, that you said oh, that they got, they got homeless in Glendale. So what yes. is that number? 28. So 35%. So they, they were living in Glendale and they became homeless? They, exactly. They became homeless in Glendale. So they, they used, Unhoused. they lived in Glendale and then because of some circumstances, they, they became homeless, they became correct. Homeless. So it's 28 people, right? Mm -hmm. Got it, thank 35%. you. 35%, mm -hmm. thank you. Sure, and we asked how long they lived in Glendale and again, 14% indicated less than a year and the second highest percentage was more than 10 years. So we had 14 respondents who indicated that they've lived in Glendale for more than 10 years. That doesn't necessarily mean that they were in a housing program or they were housed. It can mean that some clients came to our city 10 years ago, for example, as a result of the winter shelter program. Um, I myself know of several clients who are chronically homeless that came to our city as a result of our winter shelter program felt that our city was a safe place to be in, to live, you know, stay in, and they've been here since. So it, we don't go as far as seeing if they were previously housed or if they were on the streets, but they did become homeless in Glendale. And That's, I think it's very important for us to understand why did they become homeless? Is there, did they agree to kind of disclose to you? Or we did. say why were they working? Uh, is it because of the, cost of housing? Is it because they lost their job? 
they lost their family members sometimes different different tragedies make a huge difference in why you become a homeless sure. uh, person but Councilmember Garbedian, we did, and actually in the next slide, I'll kind okay, of, sorry. Um, that's okay. all right, I'll explain some of the other questions that we asked to get right. a better understanding. Um, okay, I guess, and then we actually had seven people who indicated they lived in Glendale their, their whole life, their entire life, about 8%. So we did ask why they became homeless, and these are the four main categories, um, rent increase, loss of employment, illness, divorce, or of course the pandemic um, at some point had a lot to do with, with that. So um, 10 people indicated that they couldn't afford the rent increase, so about uh, close to 12%. Um, 20, 23% indicated it was due to loss of employment, um, and then 5% unexpected illness. Um, so it was a combination of things. Divorce, family separation was about 5%. So the top two primarily was they couldn't afford the rent increase and the loss of employment. Um, but we kind of wanted to know, I know last year some questions came up by the community. What do respondents mean when they can't afford the rent increase? Are you guys able to drill down further and identify what they were previously paying to what the increase was at the time when they became homeless? So. We did ask from those respondents who indicated they became homeless as a result of rent increase. And, you know, it ranges. Some respondents, two respondents said it went, you know, it was between $400 to $770. That's way below our fair market rents in Glendale, but they were still unable to afford that, that increase. Um, and then different categories. We had 770 to about 1140. We had three people that said their rent increase fell within that range. Um, and then, of course, 1140 to 1510, we had three people um, that fell within that range, range, and so on. So the highest amount was 20 to, up to 2250, which is still based on our HUD standards within the, the fair market rents for Glendale. And unfortunately, respondents still could not afford the difference in, in the rent which means most people are probably on their fixed income, single family, um, and they do need more affordable housing options in the city. Race if and- If I may, before you sure. move on. Um, you know, I was thinking, I know the, the question posed to them was specifically about rent, right? If, if they did lose their, their home um, or inability to, to stay in a home. Um, but was there any factoring in of other things that had increased um, that attributed to that? So, you know, we've been talking a lot about inflation, right? Uh, rising costs of food, rising costs of transportation, and all of that, um, that, you know, leave less for someone to be able to pay for the rent, right? And so right. I don't know if there was an additional, like, question or whatnot asked of them to determine whether it was really the rent or was it an accumulation of all the other things that have increased over the last couple of years that have resulted in this person not being able to, whether it's maybe even be like electricity rates, right, and water mm -hmm. rates and whatever it may be uh, that they have to cover at the same time as rent. Right. Mayor Asadurian, that's a really great point that you raise. Um, each year we try to kind of add questions that we think would help us better um, understand the trends. Um, given the time that we have and having to interview each client, for example, we sometimes go out at five in the morning, we try to keep the survey answers short and we, we unfortunately don't wanna add on too much for the respondents to kind of get tired and, and uh, we only have about five minutes to do the survey. But I think for next year, we can certainly look at that, maybe modifying the question to include um, all of the other elements or reasons why um, individuals are not able to afford the rent. We're more than happy to look into it for next year and uh, update our survey. Because the ones that state that it was the increase in rate um, mm -hmm. for the rent makes sense to me, right? Like, you know, they didn't have that cushion of however much it was that the rent went up. Um, but for those that didn't mark that, then there has to be some other factors aside from the ones that were kind of listed. Um, and I don't know, I know that you had like mentioned like illness and divorce and all of those mm -hmm. other things, right? So 
um, were these categories presented to them or was it something that they said as a response? Uh, Mayor Sitarian, these categories were presented to them. I do have to say some clients don't disclose the information. They don't feel comfortable. Right. So about 46% refuse to answer the question. So we do have categories kind of go through the list and then they let us know which categories they would fall under. But um, So I, I, I guess my recommendation for the future would be to add an additional category that um, highlights like encompassing other things that went up at the same time as sure. rent, right? Absolutely, that's a great recommendation and we'll definitely do that for next year. Uh, yes. Can you squeeze in substance abuse in that 46%? Yes, we can, <coughs> we certainly can. Because um, we're, illness... we're not mentioning drug abuse. Yes, we definitely can, um, Housing Authority Member Ajamian. We can add substance abuse. We do have a separate question that does ask if they are, um, if they do have chronic substance abuse or severe, severe mental illness. And clients do answer that question separately, but maybe we can reword the question to say, uh, initially, was that as a result of your chronic substance abuse? Because some people don't have chronic substance abuse issues until after they become unhoused, right? Which came first? So we can't tweak the question to add this right. into this category. Yes. But we do have a question in there that asks if they do have chronic substance abuse. It's just, again, most of the respondents typically don't feel comfortable disclosing that information, but we ask anyway to see if some would be interested um, in services too, so. Okay, uh, jumping on to race and ethnicity demographics, this is both sheltered and unsheltered combined. Um, we had 31% of the respondents identify as white. Um, we had 16% that fell under the black African American category, um, and then Asian at 6%, multi-race. White and Hispanic was also at 6%. Um, and then we had white Armenian, which was added to our survey two years ago. Um, we had 2% that fell within that group. Um, I do have to say that there is a disproportionate um, representation. It does persist for the black African American group. Um, when you look at our overall population, we have less than 2% in our community, but they are overrepresented in our count. They're at 16%. Along with the um, Hispanic and Latino groups, they are at 32%. Um, but they represent around 18% of our population in our community. So both of these groups, similar to last year, uh, this year they are overrepresented in our count. Age demographics. Um, we had about 27% of the, the respondents uh, were under the age of 18. So slightly um, higher than last year, uh, we were at about 50. So this is 50 children. Um, I am happy to say that we didn't have any unaccompanied youth um, in, uh, on the streets on the night of the count. These are all children and families that we accounted for on the night of the count. Still a high number, but um, they were not unaccompanied. We had about 3% that fell within the transitional age youth group, which is about 18 to 24. 29% uh, fell within 25 to 44 age groups, and so on. Um, as you can see, 11% um, were within the 65 plus age groups, and I'm happy to say that we did have a decrease in that category from last year to this year. So this is just the um, age um, demographics. I have, <clears throat> sorry, I have a question on that. Do, do, do During the survey, do we kind of do we ask them their age? And if they, if they don't give their age, do we kind of guesstimate it? Or how do we do this? Council Member Broadman, we do. So exhibit two of the uh, report is actually HUD's extrapolation tool that we use to submit our numbers to HUD. So anyone who refuses to answer any of the primary questions that HUD looks for, which is the age, you know, race, ethnicity, um, and uh, gender, the extrapolation tool is able to pull in um, basically an average or an estimate of where those clients would fall under based on the data that we do have. So if we have data for 40 people, let's say 40 respondents, 
Once we enter that data and we inform them that, for example, 60 people did not complete the survey, this extrapolation tool is able to pull in the numbers and lets you know approximately what percentage percentage of those clients would fall within the age groups that you have identified. It's a very complex tool. Yeah, how does it do that? <laughs> it does that. It's a very complex formula. I don't, <laughs> it'll take me to, till tomorrow morning. But what I did this year is I actually included it as exhibit two so you guys kind of get an idea of how we submit the report to HUD. It's called HUD's extrapolation tool and they developed this tool with that in mind because when we go out on the night of the count, we have some people who just refuse to answer the survey questions and we want to be able to account for those folks to get a true accurate number um, and so this extrapolation tool helps us um, identify certain demographics or the the gender and um, race and ethnicity questions does that also apply to the the, the numbers of um people that are experiencing homelessness that we um, we measure for instance if you go up to somebody and they refuse to participate Yes. We normally would not include them, right? right? Because we don't, we may guess, but we don't know for sure that they're homeless, right? Um, does the extrapolation tool then add that number back in somehow? It does, absolutely. So you indicate, for example, how many people that you knew were homeless, but then they just, either they stop the survey questions halfway into the survey, or they refuse to answer, but it's very clear that they're, um, experiencing homelessness, you are able to use that extrapolation tool to include those individuals that refuse to take part in the in the survey questions. So, so the 179, that doesn't mean 179 completed a survey. Correct. Some of that 179 we identified on the street, they wouldn't participate at all. Some wouldn't participate at all. Some participated with some of right. the questions, not all. Right. So when we pull up our mobile app survey, it'll tell you for each question how many respondents answered and how many refused. So for each category, when you complete the extrapolation tool, for example, for gender, you say 48 responded, 62 didn't. Based on the responses that you input for the 48, it's able to extrapolate and pull data for the 62. So that way you're able to include everyone in your report. Because it wouldn't be fair not to to be able to include those that you came across on the night of the count. So it is a guesstimate, obviously it's not 100% accurate, but HUD acknowledges this and recognizes that the count is not a perfect count, it's just a snapshot, point in time. So they developed this extrapolation tool to at least be able to um, help the continuums include those numbers, or numbers for those who refuse to complete the survey. Yes quite ingenious. <laughs> I always like, how am I gonna explain the extrapolation tool? It's a complicated tool, but um, it is something. I know that in years <coughs> past, we actually were not able to include those individuals that we couldn't complete a survey for. We had to eliminate them from our numbers, and that was not fair for our continuum. So at least this helps us capture everyone. And real briefly on the gender demographics, um, we had 41% who identified as male, 58% who identified as uh, female women. Um, I do want to say that we have other categories under gender. Um, this just pulls from the, the way the respondents answered each of the questions. But again, on exhibit two, you'll be able to see a list of categories for um, under the gender demographics. Um, for the unhoused individuals and families, we have about 59% um, who identified as male, 20% who identified as female, and then one different identity. I also wanted to just kind of give you a breakdown of the number of children versus adults in our um, sheltered and unsheltered count. Again, in the sheltered count, we were at close to 50% of children, so out of the 99, 50% were children that were counted on the night of the count. And the, the rest, the fi other 50 were adults. Um, and the unsheltered count, we had about 99%, they were all adults, with the exception of the one family that we came across, the veteran father and his son, um, which we did connect to services. Um, we did identify them on the night of the count in their vehicle, so they were accounted for. Lastly, um, household composition, 
Um, we had 78 families and 101 individuals that were um, counted on the night of the count. Uh, when you look at the 2023 count results, we had 123 adults. This year we had 101. So we had about a 17% decrease in our homeless adult population. Um, in 2023, households with children, we were at 72. This year we're at 78. So there's about a 7% increase in our households with children, which is our families. This is another area that for the last three years we have been um, seeing a gradual increase. We are seeing um, more of an increase in our homeless families, um, especially in our shelter programs. Um, so we kind of have to think about new programs or prevention or diversion programs to be able to identify people right at the time where they're, you know, they're about to experience homelessness just to keep these numbers low. But um, I think that's it. I, and one last um, bit of information, similar to last year, but I did wanna include it in this year's results. We are actually, um, this is pulled directly from our survey app and we are seeing majority of the respondents or clients that we came across individuals were localized in the downtown Glendale area near Central Park. That's where we typically complete most number of surveys on the morning and the night of, of the count, near the ARC, the library. So I also wanted to include that um, in this year's report. Next steps um, for the Glendale Continuum Our Care. For the past year, our focus has been to work very closely with our lead agency, Essencia, along with Home Again LA, LA Family Housing, Village Family Services to expand our resources for homeless families and individuals um, to be able to provide more housing and supportive services locally. Um, we really do need our county partners, support and coordination um, in expanding our existing uh, homeless crisis response system. We do, we do have resources locally, but in order to be able to serve um, countywide, we do need to be able to coordinate better with our county partners. So that's, we've been working very hard on doing that. And I have to say that we've made a lot of great progress. Um, we are currently collaborating with LA Family Housing in Los Angeles along with Village Family Services. These are two <coughs> agencies that are helping our homeless families and our homeless youth um, in Glendale. We wanna continue to work strategically to reprioritize available funds to reallocate programs that are no longer HUD's priority and our local priority um, so that we can continue to maintain our competitive status with HUD. Each year, this is a competitive process. We do, go, we do get scored on our project application and so we wanna be able to keep up with that competition and HUD's priorities. With that said, I'll uh, conclude my presentation with your, uh, my requ our request to City Council and Housing Authority to um, accept the grant funds uh, in the amount of $2,930,721 from the Department of Housing and Urban Development and also to appropriate the $2,930,721 that we received uh, for the 2023 Continuum of Care Program. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I have a question. Yes. So, uh, my question is on the do domestic violence uh, uh, vic uh, victims. So as we see, the, it got higher by six compared to last year. But uh, do you know the, the number of male victims? Is that in the such thing? Uh, Housing Authority may, uh, member Parazian, unfortunately with the programs that we currently have, we have two primary programs. We have YWCA of Glendale and Pasadena. They serve as our provider for DV families, which primarily consist of uh, women and their children, and our transitional housing program um, that also consists of families, uh, women and their children. So we do, we only have data that we can pull from the system for those two groups. However, um, we can somehow begin capturing that information as part of our count. For example, when we, um, like Mayor Asaturian mentioned, well, some of the reasons why um, uh, and respondents became homeless, um, we can include that as uh, victims of DV or other types of related crimes. 
um, trafficking, you know, dating, sexual assault, you know, there's other components that we can include as, as part of our survey. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I do have uh, one question. Are we still having questions? Yes. yes. Ah. Council Member Najari. Thank you. So I, um, I understand that doing the questioning wasn't the primary purpose of the exercise for the PIT. There's some information that I think uh, I'd like to get perhaps next year when we go around. Um, are any, or what percentage or what number of these homeless are in transit who don't intend to stay in Glendale but are perhaps on their way somewhere else? If that sort of information could be available. Good question. Um, next would be what um, what could get them out of homelessness? Uh, have they lost contact with a family member, with a parent, with a child, with an organization, with um, uh, you know the basic resources to obtain uh, disability checks or welfare checks or that sort of thing? Uh, a couple of our feel-good stories in the past few years were when we connected a homeless person to a family member that they were just were not able to uh, to get in touch with. So how much of that is going on? And uh, lastly, how many of these homeless are resistant? Who, I mean, perhaps those are the ones that aren't answering your questions, the 40% or the 45%, um, but how many you know, so much of our effort is going to help those that want help, um, you know, nationally, globally. How many just don't want help? I'm not telling you how old I am, where I came from, what my rent used to be, where I'm going. What sort of um, numbers do we see in that department? We've heard anecdotally that it's quite, quite a significant number. Would our questioning bear that out next time around uh, would be helpful I think. sure and council member Nigerian to add to, to that um, just overall not just during the count but this past year um, we have seen an uptick in our transient population in the community we are coming across our outreach teams are coming across more individuals that are very high acuity they have severe mental illness or chronic substance abuse. And yes, a majority do refuse services. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is that progressive engagement piece. We're really trying to pull in, you know, the Department of Mental Health, or local mental health care providers to see how we can work with the clients to eventually get them into some type of a supportive services or some type of a program. And there are a lot of challenges with that. We don't have access locally to mental health. Um, you know, and so we're, we're trying to work with our mental health agency, one of our agencies, to see if we can start enrolling our clients. You know, some of our clients have to take, you know, eight different bus routes to get to their mental health provider. And they shouldn't have to do that. They should be able to have more access to mental health services locally. Um, so we have seen that, to answer your question, and we are trying to identify some of the reasons why there are, we're experiencing that uptick, but I will say that mental health is a huge component of why some of our clients are more service resistant. So we have to see how we can enhance our system to pull in more support from our mental health care providers. But we can attempt to capture that on the night of the count. Um, it would be a bit challenging, uh, but certainly that's something that we would try to do a better job at capturing. Thank you. Sure. Councilmember Sakian. Thank you. Um, thank you for this report. Um, some, uh, I guess, bright spots in it, but overall still the crisis that everyone seems to be dealing with, not just here, but all over, it seems, Southern California, the region, the state, um, and um, around the country. Uh, and I'm also glad that we haven't been in the news like other agencies for taking individuals and uh, transporting them, I guess is a mild way of putting it to other uh, jurisdictions. Um, I know that our police uh, unit that 
interacts with our unhoused population, takes great care in working with them and individually. So uh, the question I have, uh, uh, there's a few. One is that, um, and I've, I've come to understand this from our experience working together with you and your staff, when we are able to um, provide services to some of these individuals, I know that at one point there was an issue of finding homes or shelters for these individuals, not through a program, but even an emergency one. And then these individuals being on their own for being able to furnish the place or even get the basic clothing they need to be able to readjust to um, society. <laughs> Are we working to address those issues? I know that internally we tried to find cots and, and other things that we could provide individuals, uh, uh, beg and borrow um, whatever we could. Yes, actually, thanks to our city council, we did um, have an increase in our hotel program funding. I know this year the council approved the Measure S funds, about $300,000, in addition to the two hundred and fifty that was previously approved. Um, so we will be able to expand our non-congregate sheltering program in our community, especially during the winter months, um, to be able to house more individuals and families because we do have a need for our homeless families as well um, in the city of Glendale. So that is a huge increase in our, in our hotel um, funds. We are also trying to coordinate uh, better with our county partners. So if we do see clients that are coming through our continuum um, that are passing through at times, we try to locate our partners in LA. We have what you, we call the homeless information management, homeless management information system. So if we're able to identify the client in the system, we go as far as contacting their case managers um, to see how we can do a warm handoff and kind of have this continuation and care take place. And that has worked too. Uh, we've come a long way with that. Unfortunately, we still do need more shelter uh, beds. Um, I know that we're limited on shelter beds in Glendale. We have 45 at Ascensia. And as I have previously mentioned, not all of those beds are prioritized for Glendale. Um, in fact, Mara Saturian, I think you had asked for those numbers from me. I do have those numbers. Um, as of June 11th, um, we did run the numbers and we have about 10 clients in Glendale that are utilizing those beds. Um, 11 are from uh, West Hollywood, and then we also have, um, I don't want to mess up my numbers here, and 13 are from the city of Los Angeles. Um, the rest are kind of from surrounding cities, but those are the three primary areas. So as you can see, um, not all of those beds get utilized by um, those that we come across in our community. We do share those beds. Um, which creates a challenge for us. So one of the things that we've done is um, increased funding for our year-round hotel program to see if we can support more folks and our non-congregate well, sheltering. Thank you for that information because that was the second part of my question as to what the status of the beds and um, with uh, existing shelter programs are. So you said about 30 are from West Los Angeles? Um, 15. What I, what sorry, I will actually 15? do is let me, this is a, 11 also from West ran, Hollywood, and you said 15, maybe, from uh -huh. West? Uh, 13 from Los Angeles. 13. And we had like Glendale, one or right? two from North Hollywood. Yes. Okay. You said 11 yeah. from Glendale? Mm-hmm. 10. Uh, 10 from Glendale, 11 from West Hollywood, and 13 so, from Los Angeles. So help me understand. I, I understand that, you know, this is, again, a regional crisis. We're all in it. We all have to mm -hmm. do our part. But how does someone from Los Angeles find their way to a Glendale shelter program, given how much more money Los Angeles has uh, and other agencies have to address this crisis? Chair Kasakian, um, different and It may reasons. not be a question for you, maybe one yeah. for what some of the individuals representing um, the organizations that were listed. Mm -hmm. But I'm just curious, you know, given how much resources there are in those cities, how right. someone finds their way to Glendale. And then my other question, uh, aligned with that is when, how long that person stays there and what happens afterwards if we're not able to uh, get the individual back on the path? Does that person then go back to the area from which uh, they found their way to this program or are they then released into Glendale and the surrounding areas and it becomes again an added um, crisis and issue that needs to be addressed by the local um, uh, political bodies, whether it's, you know, Glendale or Burbank, Pasadena, whatever else it may be. 
Chair Kasakian, I do agree with you, and I'm always all about coordination, you know, collaborating with our regional partners. So when I say this to the Housing Authority and the City Council, it's not to uh, point fingers of any of our agencies. Of course, they serve everyone who's in need. It is a regional crisis, so we all do have to chip in and help out. But when you look at the resources that we have available, um, in our city and the funding that we receive, um, it just, we don't want to keep creating this inflow and the outflow is not really, you know, we're not able to exit clients as quickly into successful placements. Um, it creates a huge challenge. So um, one of the things, one of the reasons could be is some of our providers have contracts with the county. So whether it's like outreach services that they provide for the county or different types of contracts with, for example, Department of Mental Health, um, Department of Health Services. So there's different agencies in the county that can potentially contract with our agencies. So that could be one way where clients do find um, our shelter. And then also just clients passing through um, can also um, end up at our access center and, and get placed. So a multitude of reasons, but I would probably think primarily is because of contracts or programs that we have in place with our agencies that are funded for by the county. Um, so that those are just some of the reasons. I did actually run a full year report as well for the fiscal year for the emergency housing program, which Mayor Asaturian, you had asked about specifically. So uh, we had served over 206 clients at the shelter this past fiscal year, and only 80 clients were Glendale um, homeless, so about 38%. So the remaining number, you know, they're either coming from just surrounding jurisdictions. I do have the breakdown, but generally speaking, it was around 38% this fiscal year. The, that's the extent of my questions. I thank you again for the presentation and these numbers. Um, some improvements, but again, a lot of work ahead of us. Thank you. Um, if I may, uh, before passing on, since it's on that topic, um, are there other agencies that we can contract out with? Do we have options? I mean, this is something that I've been bringing up, and I'm not, you know, speaking ill of any of the organizations that do this amazing work in this space, but I am concerned about where our funding is going and um, how we're potentially not able to service our own uh, with the limited resources that we have. And so um, I had asked previously to see the contract that we have and mm -hmm. how, um, you know, at the end of the day, there is a contract we're paying for these services. and. Um, with any contract, like any, you know, both parties need to meet their obligations, um, and both looking at how we can perhaps change the contract terms uh, to ensure that our uh, community members are being serviced. Um, you know, I mean, in your numbers, you're talking about folks that have called Glendale their home their entire life and now are homeless. Um, and making sure that we're taking care of our residents that are born. So I think for me, at the very least, I, you know, it's twofold. One is taking a look at the contract and um, looking at other options, um, if, if there are any, um, by other agencies that we can potentially partner up with. Uh, because it seems like, the, you know, at the very least, the time I've been here when you brought reports, it, it's the same. Uh, kind of tune that's been playing and it concerns me that some of our numbers are up. Yes, Mayor Sitarian, yes, uh, that is an option. That's certainly something that our city can look into, um, contracting with other organizations or providers to increase the number of shelter beds. Um, you know, our general rule of thumb is with other our other funding uh, programs, for example, the Emergency uh, Solutions Grant, we are requ required to serve about 70% um, Glendale residents. And the remaining 30 can be from, you know, surrounding jurisdictions. So there is some, you know, the contract does specify some percentage. So um, we do definitely need to revisit our contracts um, and try do to see if when, we can. When the next time the contract is up with our current service provider? Um, for the ESG program, for this specific program, the emergency housing program, um, it's every f it's it's a fiscal year. So okay. this fiscal year, July first, June thirtieth of twenty twenty five is when the contract will come to an end, um, and we're you know open to looking at other agencies um, to pull in more support. I mean, I think we do this with other any of our other departments. <clears throat> um, I think it's always very healthy to put out an RFP, um, not just you know, auto renew contracts that we have. Um, you know, there is a reason why it's come fiscally 
uh, or annually, um, who actually revisits the terms and some of the concerns that we may have. Okay. Member Brotman, sorry, I, oh, uh, uh, Council Member Carpetian, and then. Yeah, I think he was not. It's okay. Oh. Okay. okay. Whatever. Um, we'll, all, we'll all get there eventually. Um, yeah, thanks for, for this and for, you know, doing this once again. I think I did it, it was probably three years ago three or two years ago, years ago um, and it was quite an experience. Um, so, um, a little bit just back to the methodology. I know uh, we talked about this when I participated in the survey a couple years ago. Um, so LA does it differently, right? LA does kind of a, a drive-by count, right? If they see somebody, they'll say, you know, one, two, three, and they'll kind of make an assumption that these people are homeless without speaking to them. Now we do it in a much more, I guess you could call it a more rigorous way, right? Where we, we go to interview. But just so I'm sure, you're saying that this this methodology that HUD has kind of equalizes that or adjusts for that so that our numbers you think are comparable even though our methodology is so different? Is that? Yes, and actually what I did, Council Member Broadman, this year is when we did do the extrapolation, um, I went in and I looked at our year-round data. So I kind of compare the numbers to our year-round data that's coming through our HMIS system, and it's very comparable to our year-round. So because I had that same concern as well, how do we make sure that these numbers are accurate? And it, pretty, it did pretty much align with the reliable data that we have um, as part of our HMIS system. So it is, and of course it's never going to be 100% um, accurate, but it uh, did align with our year-round, so. Okay, for so now, something this I've always worried, you know, I've always worried about the fact that we take a much more, I guess, rigorous, conservative approach to identifying mm -hmm. the people that are homeless, whereas LA kind of takes more of a broad sweep, and, and you know, we don't want to have that make it appear like our problem is less severe than it is, and then somehow or another we're not getting the same funding, or the amount of funding we need. So, but you're comfortable that that's not happening? Correct. Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, then um, I guess back back to the discussion we just had with, so you're saying with Essencia we have 10 kind of people that we referred, so people that we identified from within Glendale that we referred that are that are currently occupying correct you know those beds so but that doesn't mean we kind of have 10 that we get to use and that's all we get it's just a matter of who gets referred right. in and, and and how essentially prioritizes those particular individuals correct council member broadman that is correct so there is no priority there isn't you know we have three or four dedicated beds so anytime we come across somebody we make a referral we're guaranteed a space at the shelter so that's one of the challenges that we're experiencing and we have been working with Essencia. Um, we have been looking at these numbers um, and so we're trying to make sure that the, it kind of balances out right we're not expecting them to serve a hundred percent from glendale of course not but we're trying to kind of figure out how we can balance out these numbers and at least have access to some of those beds. Um, and I have to say that this is a high number, 10. Uh, they are making progress in ensuring that our clients that are being identified by our outreach teams have access to some of those beds, so. Right, okay, but you said that over time, because it, it fluctuates, right? It's 10 today and it could be a right. different number next week, right? Correct. Because they come and go. So you're saying over time about 38% is is um, the, the number of, I guess, mm -hmm. Glendale residents, so to speak, that that are being, that have been housed by Essencia. For this past fiscal year. For so the these are the year. numbers up until um, June 11th is when we ran the numbers, about 38%. So 80 of those uh, clients that were mm -hmm. occupying the shelter beds were identified as Glendale unhoused uh, right, clients. Right. Right. Do you have a, a, a multi of years? Sure, uh, um, Council Member Broadman, we can look at that. I do have to say that I have been looking at it in the last two years, uh, individually, each year, and the numbers are a lot higher this year, the 38%, um, but if that's something that we would like to kind of have an annual report on, we're happy to keep um, 
Well, I think it's, yeah, you're hearing, numbers. you know, there's general concern, like, are we getting our fair share, <laughs> you know? Right. Again, understanding there's a regional issue and everybody's kind of, we want to take care of everybody, but are we getting um, access to this facility Correct. that happens to be in Glendale and that we, I guess, we support through a lot of our funding, right? Correct. And Council Member Broadman, we actually did support in the um, the development of the emergency shelter, the acquisition. I, I believe we did put in $2 million from our Section 108 loan. This was back in 2000, forgot which, 2010. I can't remember the exact date. And um, Essencia was going to um, leverage those funds, $2 million, and making sure that they built permanent supportive housing project in Glendale, which they did, Gardena is one of the permanent supportive housing projects, and they do prioritize, um, they are required per the contract to prioritize our unhoused um, neighbors in, in those units. So that's also something that we're working with Essencia on, making sure that um, we are placing our clients into that permanent supportive housing program directly out of the shelter, once they transition out of the shelter. Okay, so. and, then the, and then on the, the hotel program, how many beds do we have available? Or is it not really, is it the number of vouchers or what, how does it work? It's not based on number of beds, it's just based on funding availability. There is a nightly rate. I believe it ranges from $114 is what we're seeing to $147. So depending on the timing for which clients need the, um, the beds, um, it's really just case by case. I wouldn't really be able to say how many, um, but I know that it's a significant help for us, especially during um, the EHV process, the emergency housing vouchers, when we had those available. We were able to quickly transition clients into those, um, into con non congregate sheltering, and then work with them to get them connected to an EHV. So it is a significant. Uh, amount of funding this year that's that's going to help our homeless and, families. And how many how many um, homeless individuals do we have in hotels right now? Right now, actually, our, our funding we've exasperated our funds for this fiscal year. Actually, just as of this week, so we currently do not have anyone um, in our programs. Um, but come July first, we will be working with clients to to get them connected to. Um, a hotel so, we don't have anything. so if somebody needs a place right now, tomorrow, we don't have anywhere to put them. We do not. Oh. That is correct. We did have some limited funds for family reunification. We have actually been working with an agency here, the National Health Foundation. Um, uh, they have reached out to us for family reunification support. So some of our funding is now going to um, provide support for that organization to help their clients reunite with their families. So. Currently, as of now, we do not. Come July 1st, yes, we will be able to provide hotel vouchers. Well, that's a bit of a concern that right now we have, we have nothing. And that's just because we've used up our budget. Correct. Hmm. Okay. Um, the, the last thing I have is just about mental services. You said we, mental health services, you say we don't. I mean, we have Dee Dee Hirsch here, right? What role do they play? And when you say we don't, kind of aren't able to refer clients into mental health. What do you mean? Council Member Broadman, Dee Dee Hirsch actually is not taking on any new clients. Um, they are not able to help any of our clients at this time. We are working on connecting with the, the agency to see how we can better support um, our clients locally, especially those who are currently housed, because one of the big, another huge cha challenge that we're faced with is the housing retention. Um, some of our clients do need ongoing case management, intensive case management, and wraparound services. So, and some of them are open to getting the services, but they're not willing to drive out, you know, 10, 15, 20 miles to get connected to a mental health provider. They want to be able to work with our local um, mental health providers. And Dee Dee Hirsch was an organization that we had been collaborating with years back. But I have to say that for the past three years, they've been at capacity. So um, they're not able to take on any new clients at this time. Mm. Okay, I would, you know, I would hope we can we can look into both the issue of the budget for you know um, the hotel program as well as this issue on, on mental health. And I know specifically there was this one one individual that we did have uh, in a hotel um, with a I think an EHV voucher and. Um, 
he, for whatever reason, stopped taking his medication or something. He was not getting treatment that he needed. So he was okay for a while, then relapsed, and we don't have any way to help him. And the hotel, Correct. I think, I don't know where it is now, but wanted to kick him out because he was being, you know, difficult. And mm -hmm. that's, that's really concerning when you see that. I'm like, we, we should, you know, we should have some way to, to support those right. people. Council Member Broadman, that is the exact individual that has to take eight different bus routes to get to his mental health provider, and he's willing to get services. So thankfully, I will say that as of this week, he has been connected to intensive case management services through DMH, Department of Mental Health. So after a month of just working with the client and DMH, um, they have been able to find a provider. But again, he has to go out in, in, in LA to be able to get connected to services. He was a former client, but of D.D. Hirsch, however, they are not able to take on any new clients at this time, which is very challenging for us when we're trying to get our clients connected to um, mental health services locally. Yeah, okay, thanks a lot. Mr. Garpickle. Yes, thank you. First, I'd like to thank you for a very comprehensive report and you have answers to every question we have, and we threw so many different things at you today. Job well done. I just wanted to mention that before I forget. Uh, so just I want to summarize everything that's in my mind. We have 179 uh, homeless individuals, 50 of them are under the age of 18, uh, 99 are sheltered, and 80 are not sheltered. And 76% of that 99 are individuals with families, basically. Am I 78, correct? 76 percent. Oh, yes, okay. sorry. That, that's okay, it's okay. <laughs> but here, I wanna go back to uh, the way we are allocating funds, the schedule, exhibit one. Uh, in the report, I see Door of Hopes, YWCA, and Essencia, that Door of Hopes took a big number of, it provided a big number of beds, 44 beds, yes. and uh, YWCA, uh, 18 beds, uh, but the, when I look at these this companies or these entities, uh, one of them is taking a big chunk, which is Consolidated Grant Shelter Plus Care, uh, that uh, 951,000, almost one third of the budget, and then we have uh, Next Step Permanent Supportive Housing, uh, which provides pretty much the same thing as Chester Street Permanent Supportive Housing, which provides the same thing as Essencia Sheltered Site Permanent Supportive Housing. And, uh, and when you mentioned that most of these companies are not in Glendale, and uh, the individuals have to take, I don't know, two or three or four buses to get to, to that service, and then con considering the number of people who do not even want to talk to us, they don't respond to a, they don't answer a question. I think that's a big issue. So this, these companies, are they, how far are they? Like Chester Street, let, let me go to this other one, Con Consolidated Grand Shelter Plus Care, uh, they're getting $951,000. Mm -hmm. Where are they located and it says Grand Shelter Plus, what, what, do, sure. what do they, what do they uh, provide basically? Council Member Garabitian, I probably should have gone over these projects um, a little bit more in detail. So these are all uh, permanent supportive housing, rapid rehousing, and rental assistance projects that are located within our jurisdiction. Um, these projects are renewal projects, so every year it's the same project, and there isn't a lot of movement. So it's almost like a Section 8 program, right? Um, but clients are connected to supportive services. So just to, for example, to answer your question on the Consolidated Shelter Plus Care Program, that's actually um, the city administers that project. It's a rental assistance program where we house 45 um, individuals and families, uh, households. Um, we contract with Essencia to provide the case management for those 45 household members and we pay for staffing salaries at Essencia. So we pay for a um, case manager to be able to work with the clients to maintain their housing. So it's, you know, every year we have to go through a recertification process. They help the clients complete their paperwork. Every year we have to do housing inspection. They make sure the clients are um, keeping up in their unit and so that, you know, so on and so forth. This one specific project is really city administered, but 
Funding goes directly to rental assistance, and a small portion goes for supportive services, which Essencia receives a con uh, contract for. It is a bit complicated. For example, Essencia is our lead agency. They actually get majority of the funding that's listed here on this grant application. They serve as our coordinated entry system for homeless individuals. So if you look at the CES reallocation project, Essencia gets over 620,951, which covers their staffing at the Access Center. Almost 100% for most of the positions are covered through the CES reallocation project, including some outreach teams. Yeah, but when you say CES re re reallocation, I it's it's it doesn't tell me that these are salaries basically or, yeah or, you know it's correct. it's it's a different different language basically it's foreign to me and i i couldn't i couldn't understand that so that goes to essencia as well so essencia get item number one two and three so far correct. which is um 600 101.2 almost 1.3 million correct. dollars within that three first items and then out of that 950,000 of that Grant Shelter Plus Care program, they get some pro portion of it for to provide yeah. services. Uh, and how about the other ones, like uh, Next Step Permanent Supportive Housing, what is? So pretty much entails? all of the projects Essencia operates, um, they do get portion of the funds for staffing and also for rental assistance, with the exception of the uh, rapid rehousing program that's listed on there. It says Family Promise, but they're now home again, LA. Uh, Family Promise of the Verdugos, um, they have a rapid rehousing program. So it's a 12 month program where families, it isn't a permanent housing program. They're able to provide rental subsidy up to 12 months for our homeless families. So with the exception of that project, the COC planning, the HMIS project supports our staff in implementing the, the system, the software. Um, we have internal data associate, um, admin associate who handles all of the data quality, pulling all the reports, um, so that covers our staff. Uh, the rest of the projects, Next Step, Housing Now, Scattered Site, um, are all uh, administered or operated by Essencia. Chester Street Permanent Supportive Housing Program, that's actually a PSH program that's a permanent housing program that's operated by our Salvation Army here in Glendale. And when you um, mentioned that 45 individuals are being housed through that Grand Shelter Plus Care Program, is it within that 44 bed uh, facility that, that Essencia has, or it's somewhere else? They come through, so all of the clients that are referred into these programs come through our coordinated entry system, which is at Essencia, it's their access center. So we do try to prioritize, prioritize um, our unhoused clients in Glendale for these projects, but again, um, you know, we do often see that there's, it, it's hard to determine that at times. So uh, we do our very best to prioritize those who are currently in need within our jurisdiction for these specific projects. Okay, so out of this 2.93, uh, can you approximately tell me what percentage of it is like the salaries of Essencia? Probably close to, I want to say maybe um, seven, eight hundred thousand. Eight hundred thousand of it? Yeah, correct. So each. Each program has at least one case manager. So for example, Scattered Site has one case manager, Next Step. Um, the Consolidated Shelter Plus Care Program act actually has two case managers, but only one case manager is funded through this program. Actually, what the city did this past year is we were able to contract with two managed care plans, uh, LA Care and HealthNet. We were able to secure around 414,000, 441,000, excuse me, for Essencia's case management team. Um, they did ask for more support for case management, so the city was able to secure an additional 441,000 to make sure that they had capacity to um, provide the services for our clients. Yeah, I have two more questions. One is so basically, last year they uh, serviced 206 individuals. 80 of them were from Glendale, as far as the, the shelter goes, or the temporary Correct. housing. And uh, in our report, fiscal impact, it says all sub recipients and city programs funded by the COC grant must provide 25% match. Uh, what, what does that mean? Is it 
the city has to match the 2.25% uh, of 2.9 million? Correct, Council Member Garabedian. So the 25% match requirement for Essentia, it's, it's in-kind and cash match, so it can be in-kind services. They can leverage, for example, mental health services from other agencies. Um, for Essentia, a portion of the 25% match, the funds that we secured through our managed care plans under the state initiative, that serves as match for this program. So we cover the full 25% match for that program at this time. Essentia does not. Uh, but for the rest of, of the other programs, for example, for the Housing Now program, they are required to match that program with 25% match. And some of that is just in-kind services. It does not have to be cash match. So I think for in the future, if there are other reports coming or what have you, I think I would like to know what is our total, uh, how can I put this in the right words, investment as far as grants and matching funds and everything else within Essentia is. Uh, it could be a note that you can send to us, just for us to know what, what we are uh, facing every year, what, what we need every year to basically maintain the same, same uh, kind of support, uh, services. Uh, council Member Garbedian, we were hoping to bring a report to Council uh, back in June. We are in the process of completing our Glendale Homeless Action Plan. Unfortunately, our consultant could not continue with, with um, the completion of the project, but we are, are working on it. And I hope to have a report back very soon. And that's one of the areas that we will be discussing with the Housing Authority and City Council is our current funding and our gap um, in funding a lot of our services. So we'll be able to provide you with a comprehensive funding plan on what we currently have and what we need to be able to um, enhance our homeless crisis response system, our homeless services in Glendale. Thank you. Again, good job. Thank you. Very nice report. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I think most of my questions got answered. Um, I think the one thing I do want to take a look at is the mental health care. Um, I don't know what opportunities we have with the county and working something out with them to make it you know, more accessible for people that are in Glendale. Um, but if there is, I think, you know, not just staff, but if we can be helpful, um, any one of us on this dais, please do let us know. Um, and then I do recognize that the motion um, also notes uh, um, to execute all agreement certifications and documents. Um, I do want to revisit the agreements that we do have uh, with the different services. So uh, prior to making any motions, um, are there any edits to that motion that would need to be done? I wouldn't want it to be just automatically renewed for, for their agreements. If you can speak to that. Oh. Sure, Mayor Asadurian. Um We have provided copies of the contracts. Um, I'll make sure that they get to you um, for uh, the Housing Authority members and City Council members if you are all interested in reviewing the contracts. Unfortunately for this year, because the funding cycle has ended for the COC program year, we do have to execute these, con we wouldn't be able to make any changes. However, our notice of funding opportunity will be released within the next month or two for the upcoming uh, funding cycle. Mm -hmm. So we're more than happy to revisit those projects and programs and see if we need to reallocate any of those projects or um, make changes to the contracts before we do anything else. I think what I'm particularly interested in is seeing options, not just the contract, um, but if you're also able to have some conversations with our service providers on some of the concerns that you heard here today um, and how we can you know, fix some of those. Um, I think it's worthwhile and it shouldn't just be coming to me. I think all of my colleagues um, should, you know, this is kind of a larger discussion. So, um, but I, I do, you know, have concerns about that and maybe even looking at a new RFP um, if we can't get to a place we need to as a city with, with our current ser uh, service providers. Thank you, Mr. Durian. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, your your representations are always just amazing. Oh, um, thank you. I'm always blown away by. It. <laughs> um, I mean, you, you know, you don't dance around the answers, and that, which I, which is something I truly appreciate. And you know, you know your stuff uh, in and out, and 
uh, it's really appreciated. So thank, thank you, you. Mayor Asadir. And if I may just add one thing, I do want to acknowledge all of our agencies and really want to thank them. It's you know really complex when it comes to you know homelessness and the issue of homelessness. So I, I do want to thank each and every one of our agencies for the work that they do. And I also forgot to thank some of our organizations that donated on the count. So if I may just acknowledge them. Um, Dignity Health, Glendale Memorial, First Baptist, and Glendale Leadership really helped this year with the donations and also volunteering for the count. So a huge thank you to them. Thank you. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Um, do we have a city uh, for the oh, city council uh, and one C is for the housing authority. Okay. So I'll move one A and B for council. Second. Start there. All right. Roll call. Council members Brotman? Yes. Arpetian? Yes. Kasakian? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Mayor Asatrian? Yes. And do we have a motion and a second for uh, housing authority? I'll move one and A and B. Is there a second? That would be for C. Would be for C. C. One, one C. C. One C. Oh, I'm sorry, one C. Second. Okay. That was moved by authority member Asatrian, seconded by authority member Parazian. May we have roll call, please? Yes, authority member Zajimian? Yes. Asadurian? Yes. Rotman? Yes. Barpetian? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Parazian? Yes. Chair Kasakian? Yes, thank you. All right. Um, adjournment is next. Right. Second. Motion to adjourn for housing authority? Move to adjourn. Second. Second. Thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>